Hi, and welcome back to Towers of Power. This is the second part in a two-part video. In this second instalment, we're going to look at the experience of residents. We're going to then look at the need for strong and effective regulation, and we're going to finish up by looking at some of the claims that proponents of tall towers like to make. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. Uh, bar, bur, bowl. Handy for Canary Wharf, outdoor jacuzzi and kitchen, 56 floor bar terrace with panoramic views, residence gym, spa and treatment rooms, and change for £5 million. Maybe I'll get two. In 2018, the Greater London Authority conducted a research survey aimed at capturing the views and experiences of residents of eight newly built major high-rise and high-density housing developments. This section of the video compares the results of this survey with an analysis of the UK's last experience of building high-rise blocks, because when it comes to high living, we've been here before. Between 1945 and 1975, the UK built 440,000 high-rise flats for public housing tenants. The speed of their construction was driven by the adoption of the Larson-Nielsen system, but ensuing structural problems and the notable incident at Rowan Point in 1968 caused the technique to fall from favour in the mid-1980s. Five main factors have been identified for what some regard as the overuse of high-rise blocks during the 60s and 70s. First, in order to protect its suburban councils from overspill, the 1956 Conservative government was anxious to rehouse inner city populations in situ. They introduced a progressive story height subsidy, which increased as the residential blocks got taller, resulting in an extra cost per flat of around 40%. Second, the largest UK construction firms heavily backed high rise as a protected market, where small builders could not compete. This also suited the government, which was keen to rationalise the housing industry. Third, the demolition initiated as a precursor to slum clearance itself created enormous housing shortage. For inner city councils, this created intense pressures to cram the maximum number of people into redevelopment. Fourth, the zeitgeist was psychedelic, with the only things taller than architects' platform shoes being their blocks of social housing. Architects and planners were heavily influenced by Corbusian dreams of towers in a park. And the final condition? The powerlessness of council tenants. Rather than wait 10 to 15 years, working their way up a council waiting list, few would refuse an offer of rehousing in a high-rise block for fear of going to the bottom of the list. Now let's compare key aspects of residents' experiences, past and present. Although the tenure and socio-economic situation is different, are there any commonalities created by the nature of high-rise living? In the past, families allocated housing too high up found it impossible to access supervised play space, and this led to claims of antisocial behaviour by other residents. The areas around the flats were unlandscaped and lacked local facilities, and the spatial structure of the new estates was alienating. Renters are predominantly younger, relatively affluent professional types with no children. Affluent downsizers and middle and low earners were unrepresented. Many of the newcomers said they felt disconnected from their wider neighbourhoods. Gentrification was a cited concern. The financial burden of providing subsidised housing and meeting the expense of maintenance and the high attrition costs of shared plant was hard to sustain. Rising service charges are a consequence of shared plant and technologies not needed in low-rise dwellings. More frequent building maintenance was also needed due to the high wear and tear and the high-tech nature of the buildings themselves. Cash-strapped local authorities found it difficult to keep up with the backlog of repairs, whilst long waiting lists for alternative housing types gave residents few options. Structural problems created heat loss and common areas were impossible to maintain and were subject to vandalism. The nature of high-rise buildings makes it impractical for residents to manage the common plant themselves, and communal decision-making can be complicated. A lack of personal control was identified as an issue, 
Complaints about buildings overheating and noisy neighbours were expressed by some residents. Over the ensuing decades, for those blocks not demolished, and to improve their thermal performance and aesthetic shortcomings, the widespread use of ACM cladding materials became common and the practice extended to new-built private market properties as well. The demonisation of high-rise social housing had facilitated the under-resourcing of safety and regulatory regimes. And that brings us on to the next section, which covers regulation and begins with my fourth assertion. Namely, that when things go wrong, local and central government are slow to accept their policies and regulations are part of the problem, and that the asymmetrical power relationship between regulator and resident facilitates foot-dragging, especially when the financial ramifications for authorities are potentially severe. I want to read you a few lines of the final report produced by the Independent Review of Building Regulations and Fire Safety. It was commissioned by the UK government following the Grenfell Tower disaster to make recommendations on the future regulatory system. Of the system failure that led to Grenfell, the following issues are cited. Ignorance. Regulations and guidance are not always read by those who need to, and when they do, the guidance is misunderstood and misinterpreted. Indifference. The primary motivation is to do things as quickly and cheaply as possible. When concerns are raised by others involved in building work or by residents, they are often ignored. Some using the ambiguity of regulations and guidance to game the system. Lack of clarity. There is ambiguity over where responsibility lies, exacerbated by a level of fragmentation within the industry and precluding robust ownership of accountability. Inadequate regulatory oversight and enforcement. The size or complexity of a project does not seem to inform the way in which it is overseen by the regulator. When enforcement is necessary, it is often not pursued. Where it is pursued, the penalties are so small as to be an ineffective deterrent. High-rise construction, compared with more traditional forms of housing, inevitably requires complex building works and high levels of technology in order for this type of construction to function. It is vital that adequate regulatory oversight and enforcement tools are in place. In the aftermath of Grenfell, despite the publication of new recommendations, wrangling over who should foot the bill continues. For those saddled with enormous cladding replacement costs and waking watch service charges, negative equity and uninsurable homes, the impact of inadequate regulation continues. And now, in this section, I want to look at three claims that proponents of London's ever-increasing number of upscale residential towers make, namely that by building tall and therefore increasing density, that these developments are helping with London's housing shortage, represent an efficient use of land by increasing density, and therefore are more energy efficient. So let's start with the claim that we're not building enough housing. If there's a housing shortage, why does the graph show that in England in 2018 there were 1.1 million more dwellings than households? If housing supply is outpacing household formation and the real cost of housing is stable, why have London's house prices gone through the roof? 47% real terms price growth since January 2005. London's housing crisis is one of affordability, not supply per se. Housing belongs to two separate but linked markets. The first market is for housing services, where supply and demand is evened out by rents and mortgages. That's the market for people wanting a house to live in. But a second market sees housing as an investment opportunity, where property is viewed as an asset safe haven. Quantitative easing erodes the value of money and increases the demand to buy assets. By November 2020, the Bank of England had purchased £875 billion of UK government bonds. So with lots of credit and historically low interest rates, it's not surprising that house prices have soared. Low interest rates make buying housing more attractive than renting. This is the result of the global hunt for yield, where properties in major global cities offer a different investment proposition to those elsewhere. In this light, building expensive high-rise apartments isn't helping reduce house prices. It's supplying investor demand for housing assets due to London's status as a global player. And the second claim is building high a more efficient use of land. In 2015, the mathematician architect Lionel March 
illustrated that by distributing the same volumes in different arrangements, the same densities can be achieved with strikingly different layouts and characteristics. But even if developers do stack them up, that doesn't necessarily mean they're achieving density. Density can be a complex calculation. We need to look at the number of dwellings per hectare and the number of habitable rooms per dwelling and the floor area of those dwellings and the household size per dwelling. Density doesn't look at demographics. The actual densities at which developments will be occupied are far more directly affected by the density of the surrounding area due to socio-economic factors. So actual densities are the outcome of demand as constrained by the relative cost of living in different locations. And if density is good, is more better. And for whom? High densities at individual sites can make less impact at a neighbourhood level and virtually none at all at the city level. And finally, the sustainability claim. If going high won't make London's housing more affordable and isn't necessarily housing more people, what about being a more sustainable way of building? A growing number of engineers are calling for a value to be given to the resources that go into a building, what is called its embodied energy. Tall buildings are more structurally demanding, often employing more steel and concrete and require more substantial foundations and cores. So judging the amount of embodied energy as that consumed by a building throughout its life might be a good proxy for energy efficiency. This is referred to as the cradle to grave method. The energy consumption should include the energy required to initially produce the building, including the energy used for the extraction of the materials, as well as their transportation and assembly on site. It should also include the energy needed to refurbish and maintain the building over its lifetime and also the energy necessary to demolish and dispose of the building at the end of its life. And don't forget the operational energy too required to utilise the built product. However, currently the tightening of building regulations is focusing on operational efficiency only, and that's just the running costs. It's been estimated that in the UK the embodied energy in complex commercial buildings may be the equivalent of 30 times the annual operational energy use. So focusing on running efficiency, whilst important, could be missing the bigger picture. Today the construction industry is the largest consumer of natural resources in the UK, with over 400 million tonnes of material consumed each year. This accounts for approximately 10% of total UK carbon emissions. So ends the second video in the Towers of Power series. In the first video, we looked at urbanisation, at urban economics, and the role of the planning system. In the second video, we focus more on residents and the experience they had past and present. We also looked at the need for strong regulation and we finished up by looking at some of the claims that proponents of tall buildings make. Hopefully having watched both videos, you can now see behind the glitz and glamour of these tall structures. If you found these videos enjoyable, please subscribe for more similar content. And as ever, thanks for watching.